Can you fly for less than you can drive? Yes, and I'll tell you how in this installment of Added Value for your piloting adventures. We've talked a lot about aeronautical variety in this series, and I've had fun with it. I hope you have too. We've talked about the beauty and the challenge of flying airplanes with a third wheel on the tail instead of on the nose. We've talked about seaplanes, which are fun, 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 and remarkably practical. We've even talked about gliders, which have given us the hushed silence of being able to fly without the annoyance of engine noise or fumes from fuel and oil. Now let's wrap up this series with a chat about a type of flying you might have never considered. It's less expensive than any other kind of flying I know. It provides the pilot with a level of freedom that I think of as being unparalleled in general aviation. And maybe best of all, it gives even the most modest budget a real shot at being an owner. That means you can go out and fly to your heart's content just about any time your schedule and the weather combine to create an opportunity. I'm talking about powered paragliders. Now you might be saying, what is a powered paraglider? No worries, I was in that camp once too. But once I opened my eyes, learned a bit about what's really out there and available to us, these light, small, inexpensive flying machines really caught my attention. Look, I can go on all day about how affordable, fun and cool the world of powered paragliding is. But rather than just blabber on for an hour or so, I thought it might be more interesting if I brought in one of the most aviation oriented people I know to talk about these machines that live most comfortably at the very bottom of the aeronautical pyramid. Let me introduce you to Jeff Goyne. Jeff isn't some weird hobbyist who gets a thrill out of taking big risks. In truth, he's a senior airline captain for a major airline. This guy knows about proficiency, high quality training, risk mitigation, and maybe most importantly, how to have a whole lot of fun while flying whatever aeronautical dream machine floats your boat. In addition to the airline gig, Jeff also owns and flies a Beach Bonanza, an Enstrom helicopter, a weight shift trike, and there's a real authority on the ins and outs of flying powered paragliders. He even wrote a book about the art and science of it. It's called The Powered Paragliding Bible. He's so into this sport that he founded the Powered Paraglider Association to provide education and advocacy for folks who delve into this less well-known corner of the aviation market. My first question for Jeff was, are powered paragliders really all that much fun? It is the most fun I have ever had in the air because it is most like flying like a bird. You run into the air after all. Uh, and it's magical. You inflate the wing, you get running, a little more speed, lift, you feel the lift, and then you're flying, you're airborne. And now with an appropriate amount of control, you can basically go to the wear of your whims. It's really amazing. Another weird experience that you'll probably not notice in other craft, flotsam in the air. Oh. Little pieces of seeds and things, and, and it really makes you feel like you own the 3D world. Now a practical question. Where do we fly powered paragliders? It's interesting that uh, I and others have flown out of DuPage, which is the executive feeder airport for jet traffic, business jet traffic, southwest of O'Hare. So you can fly out of those. It's just more difficult. This but is that classic thing. There's an exception to everything. Everything, yeah. But mostly we fly in G and E airspace. You launch from the E, go up into the E, uh, uh, but most of the fun is down low because mm -hmm. it's one of, this, one of the types of craft that you can fly with reasonable safety down low. Mm -hmm. You're only going 20 miles an hour. You can see it before you hit it. So, and, and the other thing about that is that I can do it anywhere I can take it 
and it's extremely portable. You can put it in a regular car if you're willing to disassemble it a little bit, or you could put it on the back of a carrier on the regular car and you don't even have to disassemble it. You could be airborne in 10 minutes. So you're driving along and it's like, ooh, hey, this looks cool. I'll bet it'll be cooler over there. You pull off, find a place, launch, and go check it out. Wait a minute, Jeff. Are you saying I can launch from my yard or a public park? The big problem is permission to use that space. So if nobody's going to object to you, now I treat it a little bit like, well, can I go play Frisbee there? Mm -hmm. I don't go by a no trespassing sign. I don't go over fences. But uh, roadsides, I've done roadsides. Uh, fields like the park you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can launch. It takes about 200 feet of run. Now you may not use all of that 200 feet, but you wanna have 200 feet of run and then another 200 feet to be able to climb out or, and or circle. And that's once you are a reasonably skilled pilot. So the lesson here is be a good neighbor. If the property owner is willing to allow you to fly from their field or park or yard, you're probably good to go. Now, that, that doesn't mean you don't have to comply with federal regulations. As you might imagine, powered paragliders fall under the federal aviation regulations too. But the FARs are not Part 121. That's for airlines. Or Part 135, that's charter operators. And 91 is what most of us fly under. Nope. Powered paragliders fall under FAR Part 103. And what is Part 103? The most beautiful piece of regulation ever placed on pilots. It's two pages long in most print, and it basically says, don't endanger the others. You wanna take your own risk, that's fine. Don't endanger the others. Don't go in their airspace where they're likely to be and uh, have a ball. There's no certification required. There is voluntary certifications, much like scuba. Uh, you don't have to get training. You, you don't have to get training in scuba. You can go down there and die all by yourself if you want, but it's beneficial to get training. You're less likely to do the dying thing. So it's uh, entirely up to you on risk management. So if my safety is entirely up to me, and it is, where do I go to get training or to learn more about flying powered paragliders? Well, go to the U.S. Powered Paragliding Association. Um, I'm obviously going to recommend the book, The Powered Paragliding Bible. I'm sorry, which book? The, uh, the Powered Paragliding Bible. Who wrote yes. that, Joe? Yeah, yeah. Someone had to do it, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, there was a need, and I figured, okay, I, I guess uh, there's a story to that, but I'll, I'll spare you that story. Uh, but... You find a good instructor who's certified and follows the USPPA syllabus. That way you have some reasonable assurance of learning the material you need to learn. Uh, then I recommend go to a school that will rent you gear and use a beginner wing. There are some dark corners. As mm -hmm. you can imagine, there are some dark corners in training. That turns out to be one of the riskier times in your career. Uh, so so is that beginner wing, the Cessna 150 or the Cherokee 140, you don't start out in an extra 300? Bingo. Okay. Right. And then if the school, a lot of people say, hey, I don't want to buy a, a school wing. They're no fun to fly. Well, I actually argue that they are a lot of fun to fly. And once you're skilled, you can make them do a lot. Uh, but the good thing is, before you're skilled and you know how to make them do a lot, they won't let you do the dumb things that are those really dark corners. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, there's some things where you pull the brakes all the way down. Well, we'd rather that not be a death sentence. Mm -hmm. And if you are appropriately loaded on a beginner, an ENA wing, there's ENA through D, where D is the most demanding. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that type of buffoonery won't give bad results. Now, Jeff flies a lot of really impressive aircraft, both large and small. But I was curious, with all the aircraft he gets to fly, what attracted him to the power paraglider? How did he get sucked into making the investment in time and training to do this? I think it was latent desire triggered by a friend of mine who called me. Now he knew I was an easy mark because at that time I had just gotten the helicopter. Mm -hmm. And he said, hey Jeff, you wanna go in with me on a powered paraglider? 
I thought, oh, what? And I started doing a little research, and at first I thought they were barely controllable. You more influenced it, kind of like a balloon. Mm -hmm. I imagined the guy in the lawn chair over L.A. shooting his balloons to descend. And what I found out was you have immense control. Um, you can go within inches. In competition, the, uh, the competitive pilots land on a Frisbee. Mm -hmm. You have that level of control. So when I found out that you could do that with reasonable safety and you could launch that thing on foot, I went nuts. That was just the coolest kind of flying I could imagine turned out to be. You want to go down and fly around this field at a foot, dragging your foot? You could do it. I got to admit, I saw a competition once over at Fantasy of Flight and guys were doing a foot drag through a drainage ditch. And it's only a foot or two deep, but they were literally just dragging a toe, making yeah. a wake in the water. And they were not undulating up and down. Nope. They were just rock solid coming through it. Is that all about the proficiency of flight? The same thing we'd seek, the, maybe the mastery yeah, that we're, we're trying in fixed wing. Same thing? In same thing. Lighter? And there are some very specific techniques. I mean, we cover that in the book later on. There's some, not just how do you do it, because there is some weirdness it's a pendulum, mm -hmm. both in roll and in pitch. That takes a lot to manage. The brakes are immediate. You get immediate lift, you swing a little bit, but they're immediate. Whereas the throttle, you just swing out, takes a little bit more. So there's a technique that you can learn and you can have control over the inches once you know that technique. It, are the brakes on a powered paraglider somewhat analogous to the flaps on an airplane where we can introduce drag? To they it, are. Or is it a different that, thing? No, it, that is true, and that happens. That absolutely is a tool that you use to control height in maybe a range of a few feet. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a combination of fine dance of throttle and brake input because if you apply brakes, you add immediate lift, go up a little bit, but you slow down. So let's say you descend a little bit more, you get a little bit of a downdraft, apply a little bit more brake, uh, you get a little more immediate lift, but not as much. And you slow down a little bit, lose a little energy. You can see where this is going. And not too terribly long, you're no longer adding height. You're just slowing down, and now you're going to keep slowing down. So you need to add throttle enough to keep you in that sweet spot. And once you learn that, it's remarkable uh, how, how, how you can control your height, how accurately you can. When we talk about the speed range of a powered paraglider, it's dependent on the wing, the envelope above your head. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about speeding up and slowing down, we're just talking about a couple miles an hour in a transitory way, right? Because it, oh, you, it's kind of fixed to the, the you, wing. The, there's a big effect of weight versus wing area and wing style, of course, because if you have a competition wing, it'll go faster. You have some speed controls on it, uh, but you can control it through a range of about... 17 for, let's say, a, a higher end wing, 17 to 42 mile an hour. Mm -hmm. So you have a fair amount of control on that type of wing. But as you go faster, there are some concerns. You got to be careful about turbulence. As with anything. I mean, yeah, Motorcycle, exactly. boat, car, yeah. the faster you go, the better you better be at this. Yeah, and there are a couple dark corners about going fast that you need to learn about before you use the speed bar. Because... It's, uh, it's, you know, you're, when you lower the speed bar, you're doing this, and you throttle up, because you always got to have some positive angle of attack. But if that wing, if anything causes that wing to start folding down at high speed, it'll tend to take the whole thing with it briefly. Mm -hmm. It recovers, but... It's an exciting moment. It's an exciting moment, and you may not be in exactly the same attitude. <laughs> Fair enough. That all sounds great. Training can help us fly powered paragliders safely and with tremendous accuracy. But what about the fun factor? Is there adventure to be had at 20 miles an hour? There is, uh, I think the people who enjoy flying the most enjoy the element of being able to see the earth in 3D from above and be able to control a craft in 3D. They enjoy the mastery of that. But you don't have to do both. Mm -hmm. uh, you could, just love being able to see the world in 3Ds, get a new perspective. And that might be the guy who takes off, climbs to 200 feet, cruises around and enjoys the scenery. And he's having just as much fun as the guy who likes to tear it up down low and see what he can master. 
Now, you might have noticed that a powered paraglider pilot is wearing his or her aircraft on their back. So, how hard is that to deal with? What does one of these babies weigh, Jeff? So for a person who weighs less than, say, 200 pounds, you can get a motor that commonly weighs 45 pounds. Then add another 10 pounds of gas, you're at 56 pounds, another four pounds of the goo that people tend to bring with them. <laughs> so you can see that you're at 60 pounds. So I have a five, six-year-old on my back. Yeah, and the beauty of it, especially once you get a little bit better at it, you're not carrying it for long. You strap in, get in front of the wing, do your checks. Uh, depending on your launch technique, you uh, will just start running to get the wing overhead, throttle up as it approaches overhead. And the moment you get to about six miles an hour, it's starting to lift the motor up. By eight miles an hour, you're not carrying the motor anymore. So you shift from the pilot carrying the motor to the motor carrying the pilot. Pretty quickly. Let's talk about cost, because as we all know, flying ain't cheap, or is it? You can buy decent used equipment for uh, wing and motor for probably $6,000. Then you pay $3,000 to $5,000 for training, for good training. That's mm -hmm. a good investment. Don't mm -hmm. skimp on that, oh, please. Keep you alive. Keep you alive. And keep you thriving you know mm -hmm. you'll learn how to do things that'll help you in different conditions so so there you're looking at 10k new equipment you might be up to 18k and i don't know that more expensive gets you that much better it's not mm -hmm. like well i'm going to put a jet engine in it you're not going to put a jet engine in right it. So, we're talking about fairly low horsepower motors yeah right? you really and more horsepower isn't better more horsepower in the beginning stages is dangerous for some really good reasons. Well, kind of like, I, and I often relate these things to motorcycles. You don't want to start on a Hayabusa that'll do 200 miles an hour. Right. You start on a little 250 or 300, it's got 28 horsepower and you just put, put around and you kind of learn how it works. Right. Then you make a decision. So I, I'm assuming, much like we don't start out, outside of the military, we don't start out in jet aircraft. Right. You're better off in being something that's very docile, very easy to control, easy yeah. to launch, easy to land where you can get up one more and say, well, I was planning to fly, but the wind's 15, so I guess I'm not. And right. it's, I know why I'm not. Right, exactly. And you'll learn that in training. If you go to training, that's, it's not just the hows of it, but it's the how not to, mm. and when not to. Uh, it's like, oh, I, I never thought of that. Well, there's quite a few of those moments when you, if you go to good training where you learn how to tell. It's good. Just reading the weather is, is one thing or listening to it, watching it on the phone. Uh, and what to look for to not go. Now, before we wrapped up our talk, I asked Jeff to share two very important stories. First, what advice would you give to someone who was seriously thinking about giving powered paragliders a try? His answer is a good one. One, go to USPPA.org, find an instructor. Uh, find an instructor who will rent you gear, uh, explain your situation, your weight, Go through the training. Now you only have the obligation of the training. Then buy gear. And uh, somewhere in there, you'll probably want to read that book. So I can, so I can get involved fairly inexpensively. I mean, truly, mm -hmm. motorcycle yeah. money inexpensively. Yeah. Used motorcycle money inexpensively. I can try it and see if I like it. And if I want to go from there, I'm not going to spend as much as I spent on my car. And right. I can fly this thing. By the way, how long does a wing last for? Is it one season it's, or? It's, oh, no. Oh, no. You can go many seasons. If you, uh, they don't like sunshine. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't particularly like hungry grasshoppers, it turns out. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, avoid those. Interesting. I'm sure there's a story. That yeah, 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 yeah. Don't ask me how I know that. Uh, so, no, if you store it, take care of it, and don't leave it out in the sun when it's not flying, you can get many years out of it. Uh, a common number you'll hear is 300 hours of sun life. And, uh, you know, if you're pulling on the lines in a dusty environment, probably won't get as much time. But around here, where we have nice grass, good launches, you could easily get five years out of it. If you fly it hard, you may get one year out of it. If you're, you know, do, like get into acro and mm -hmm. flying out of sandy sites all the time, you got to be careful with that. Uh, but also, it's probably the only aircraft you can put in your aircraft. Speaking of quite amazing, I want to close out with this, if you're willing. 
You used to travel around the entire country. You had a motorhome that was named... The Enterprise. And you traveled all around America and really just made it easier to transport the power paragliders. Yeah. You had a place to sleep. You had a place to eat. And went and did all that. You had a very special guest in the Enterprise at one time, didn't you? Yes. Who was that guy? That was William Shatner. Captain James Tiberius Kirk yes. was in your Enterprise. Yes, he How was. How did that come about? He wanted to fly a paramotor into a charity event near Chicago and contacted me about organizing that. And I did. I got Nick Schultes to be the instructor, lined up the gear, and we did it. And we had made some, uh, some requests, some requirements, really, that we didn't want to be the guy that killed William Shatner. Mm -hmm. So we said, we need you to be able to inflate the wing at the training field, turn around, and run with it. And if you can do that, we're happy to continue on. Uh, and so we went to another site where they were filming some scenes. And uh, from there, we went to the practice field and we went out to uh, check out the landing site in the motorhome. That's how he wound up riding it. And he also rode in the helicopter and that flew is, the helicopter. That is the coolest yeah. thing. So powered paragliders, which may be perceived as the low end of aviation, is maybe on a fun factor scale very near the top end of aviation and you never know who you're going to bump into. You never know. Jeff, thanks a lot. I appreciate your time on this. My pleasure. Good man. Thank you. And there you have it. If powered paragliders are good enough for the captain of the Enterprise, maybe they're worth the rest of us taking a look at too. I hope you do, and when you do, I hope you'll carry the overarching message of M0A with you no matter which aspect of flying you pursue. And what's that message, you ask? Well, you know what it is. A good pilot is always learning. I'll see you next time.